Okay, I think we're, we're all ready to get started now. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have a really good session for you today. My name is Sriyanka, and I'm the Wikimedia Race and Knowledge Equity Fellow. Uh, the fellowship is designed to explore the intersection of racial equality, racial equity, intellectual property, and access to knowledge. So in other words, my work involves finding ways that intellectual property laws can become more inclusive and accessible to everyone. But, you know, especially for the communities that have been historically marginalized and underserved and face barriers to reaping the benefits of intellectual property or face barriers to knowledge. Uh, today's webinar is part of a series uh, from IIPSJ called IP for the People. And, you know, these webinars are just one way in which we want to make IP law more accessible to everyone. Uh, tonight's webinar will be focusing on IP basics for creators. So, you know, whether you're an artist or a photographer or a singer, what are the IP basics that you need to know as you embark on your creative journey? So to tell us more today, we have a really great panel of speakers. We will be oh, just, that's it. Okay, we will be starting you off with a presentation followed by a panel discussion, during which time, if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, okay, I'm gonna present our panelists for today, starting with Lita Rosario Richardson. Lita is a partner at Shulman Rogers in Potomac, Maryland and heads their entertainment law group. She had her own practice for 25 years before joining Shulman Rogers and specializes in music law, but she also does TV and film. She has represented many famous clients like Missy Elliott, Drew Hill, Cisco, and Crystal Waters, who is the next guest I will be introducing. Crystal Waters is a multi-platinum singer, songwriter, and producer named by Billboard Magazine as one of the most successful dance music artists in the history of the Billboard Dance Music Chart. She's best known for her string of domestic and international number one dance hits in the 1990s, including her 90, 1991 signature smash, Gypsy Woman. Last but not least, we have Kim Tignor. Kim is the executive director of IIPSJ and the founder and executive director of Take Creative Control, an advocacy organization that serves creators facing marginalization in their creative pursuits. Her expertise includes IP law, free expression, civil rights, diversity in media, and economic justice. And she previously directed policy at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. So as you can see, um, Lita will be giving the run through on the basics for IP creators, uh, IP, oh, sorry, basics of IPs, IP for creators, after which we will move into a panel discussion with Crystal and Kim, uh, who will join Lita, um, which I will also be moderating. Um, so I think with that, we are ready to hand it over to Lita to tell you about intellectual property for uh, creators. Thank you. I think you're muted, Lita. Hi, everyone. Wonderful to be here today, um, along with Kim and Crystal, of course, and Trianka. Thank you for putting this all together. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a basics. I've taught for, I don't know, entertainment law for, I guess, 25 years or something. So I'll try to go through this in a way that is digestible for everyone and try to give you all some important pointers. And what is intellectual property is the first question. So intellectual property is uh, copyrights, trademarks, patents, um, publicity rights, uh, and privacy rights, they kind of go hand in hand to a certain extent, and then also trade secrets. So I'm going to talk about each one of those and give you some, a couple of examples just to help you understand, because I often hear people mistaking uh, what's really a trademark for a patent or saying they want to copyright something that they really think they need, that really needs to be trademarked or saying that they want to copyright something that really should be patented. So it's important just to know the difference between the different types of rights. So we'll start with copyrights and copyrights are um, rights that attach to, and they're called intellectual property rights because they're intangible rights. These aren't things that you can necessarily hold or touch, but they are rights that we have in law. 
And so copyrights are uh, there to protect what we call original works of authorship. So certainly um, recording artists um, have copyright protection for both their master recordings and the songs that they write. And that's something important about the music business that a lot of people don't understand is that there's two copyrights that are uh, subsisting together in the music industry. One is in the master, which is the recording of the song, and the other is in the song itself. So as an example of that, if I were to go into the studio and record Michael Jackson's song Thriller, me singing Thriller, I would own that recording of me singing Thriller, but I don't own Michael Jackson's recording of Thriller, and I don't own the song Thriller, right? Thriller is separately a separate copyrightable work that's called a musical composition or a song in common language. And that has a separate copyright than the copyright that exists in the recordings of that song. And many different people can record the song. Um, so also fine artists get a copyright in the work that they create. So if I'm a painter and I paint a, 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 a work and I sell that work to someone else, they're not getting the, my copyrights when I sell it. I'm selling the physical copy of the work, which is different from the copyrights, right? So today music is all streaming. So before there was streaming, we used to have physical copies. Some of you may still see physical copies of music, DJs and stuff who have vinyl copies. Those are physical copies. They are not the copyright. They are a physical copy. If you own that physical copy of a record, you can sell that physical copy to someone else. Same thing with a book. Once again, book authors get a copyright in the work that they create. Films, uh, television, videos, uh, video games, they all have rights that are what we call copyrights. And the essence of copyright is that you get the right to copy. What does it mean? What it means is that the owner of the copyright has the right to make the copies, or they can sell those rights or transfer or license those rights to another party. So essentially, um, the thing itself that is created is not what the copyright is. The copyright is an intangible right. So if I'm that painter and I sell a painting, all I've sold is the painting. I have not sold the copyrights. And the Copyright Act says that in order for a copyright to be sold or transferred to another person, it must be in writing. So if you in any way are working with an artist or you're the artist and someone's investing money and they don't have a written agreement that says that they own part of your works and they don't own the works, even if they gave you money to help you record or create it, that doesn't give them ownership. The only way they get ownership is through a written document where you sign and they sign and it's clear that you're transferring your ownership to your copyrights. Copyrights last, meaning they subsist for life of the author plus um, an additional 70 years. And I should say life of the last surviving author plus an additional 70 years. That's a long time for copyright to last. That's how long you can continue to get royalties or if you own copyright. So most for instance, fine artists sell limited edition prints and different types of prints of their works. That's how long they have the right to do that. That's how long recording artists have a right to receive royalties. So it's really important that we understand these rights because they're inheritable. Ch your children, your grandchildren, or anyone that you gift it to or give it to will have these rights for life of the last surviving author plus 70 years. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about trademarks. Trademarks, as opposed to copyrights, are um, they show, they establish a designation or origin of a good or service. So what that means is, for instance, let's take Gucci as a trademark. When you see Gucci on a piece of clothing, that means that it's made by Gucci, right? Unless someone is has knockoffs of it, but that's that's obviously a violation. That's a trademark infringement. But what it does is confirm to you as a consumer that this quality of this product is the quality that Gucci has established for itself and its reputation over the years. Likewise, for Nike, it's a way for Nike to distinguish itself from um, you know, Under Armour or, you know, any other company, Adidas, 
Fila. So trademarks are a way of you establishing an identity, a designation of origin for a product or a service. So a recording artist would get a trademark in their name or if they start a record label in the name of their record label right? If you're a fashion designer, that's the most important thing you can do is secure your trademark. And it's important to understand, and people talk about it as branding today. Everyone throws around that word branding, branding. But branding begins with the concept of some type of a mark, whether it's a word or a picture or anything else else that is designating your brand and letting the world know that that brand is your brand. Which brings me to the Louboutin shoes, the red bottoms that everyone is so familiar with. That's an, uh, something that they wanting to claim a trademark in, a designation, something that defines their product. Today, we're seeing that people are actually getting trademarks that relate to specific sounds or specific colors in order to designate their, their what their company represents and to designate their company and to distinguish it in the marketplace. Trademarks, unlike copyrights, are based on use, right? And a trademark will last forever as long as you file, make filings with the federal uh, trade, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and you have to secure a trademark in every other country of the world separately. That's another distinction for copyrights. For copyrights, you copyright your work in the U.S., you're pretty much protected all over the world. Not the case for trademarks. So if you establish your brand in the United States and you don't secure that brand in China, Australia, Europe, someone in the, one of those countries can take it. And it's not theft. They can register the mark and begin using it. So trademarks are based upon use and you have to go through formalities to secure them. They can last forever as long as you're using them forever and you're complying with the law in terms of giving notifications of your use as is required in whatever jurisdiction you live in. So next we'll talk about patents. Patents are there to protect um, inventions and they are there for inventors or people who acquire rights for inventors, or they can also relate to design and they relate to a functionality uh, very interestingly. And so, you know, uh, interestingly, new instruments can get patents. So when someone first invented the, uh, the electric guitar, they were able to get a patent for that. And what patents give you is typically an exclusive right for 20 years. Now, each one of these three main intellectual property rights that we're discussing, which are federally recognized, the copyrights, the trademarks, and the patents, they, inter they interact and interrelate with each other. So if you're a recording artist, you would need a copyright to protect your work, your creative work, your masters and your musical compositions, but you need a trademark to protect your image, your name and likeness and who you are. Um, and let's say you invent something then you might need to get a patent in order to cover that invention. So these things can all interrelate together. Um, a com and with logos, for instance, let's say you want to trademark your logo, you can also oftentimes get a copyright for the actual artwork, which is distinct from the trademark. Okay. And with patents, uh, a good example of how they interrelate is with regard to computer software. So with a new computer software, you may be able to get a patent for the functionality of the software, but not necessarily um, for you know, what the actual code itself. The code itself, you have to get a copyright for. So those in that case, the functionality and the copyright of the code are working together to give you the panoply of protection that you need when you create software. Um, and so patents are very interesting. Um, another good example that you should think about with patents, patents only last for about 20 years. In general, they're 20 years. Some are a little longer, some are a little shorter. Lawyers are always trying to figure out ways to extend patents by improving things. And we can see this with pharmaceuticals. Most of you know about um, pharmaceuticals that are off-brand 
And when they're off brand, they can't use the name. And I'll just use Viagra as an example, since a lot of people know that particular drug. So the company that owns the mark for Viagra, they only had a patent for 20 years to protect anybody else from using it for 20 years. After that, generic versions can come onto the market, but they can't use the name Viagra. So that's why generic medicines always have a different name than the name of the original drug because the patent has expired. So other companies can now make that same drug, but they can't market it under the same name because it's protected by a trademark. Um, lastly, I'll just go into a little bit of discussion of publicity and privacy rights, and also um, talk a little bit about trade secrets. And in general, the law that relates to these things is, is state law, common law, although there is a new statute that relates to trade secrets. But in general, most of the different states in the United States have different laws regarding what your rights of publicity are. In general, rights of publicity are for people who have put some investment or some investment of branding has been made in their in their persona, in their name, image, and likeness. And we all hear this term NIL. A lot of people are talking about it regarding athletes, um, how college and high school athletes are now able to do NIL deals, name and likeness deals, or do social influencing and things like that. So this is all about publicity rights. And depending upon what state you're in, your publicity rights can vary or the publicity rights can vary regarding what your rights are regarding your name and likeness. Um, and many states have statutes that relate to these rights as well. And in general, if you have invested in your name, image, and likeness, you have a right to protect that. If you're a celebrity, if you're a politician, if you're someone who has some right to have your, your interest protected, then you have a right to protect that. Now, the kind of opposite right to that is the right of privacy. And the right of privacy is the right for you to say, I don't want anybody taking any pictures of me. I don't want my image, my name, or my likeness to be used by anybody else for anything else. And for the average person, oftentimes, your right of privacy is what you would be focused on if someone like took your picture and used it in a publication and didn't pay you for it. That would be a violation of your privacy rights. And so that, that's how privacy rights work. Um, California, Tennessee, New York all have specific statutes because they're statutes where a lot of creators are, the entertainment industry is that relates to these things, um, as opposed to some other states that aren't as involved and don't necessarily have those types of statutes, but some of them actually do. Um, New York just passed a new uh, publicity statute that said in general, publicity rights die when you die. And so that's why anybody can write a book, for instance, about President John F. Kennedy. You don't have to go to his estate and ask for permission. Anybody can write a book about someone basically after they pass away. But New York, um, California, and I believe Tennessee too, they all have created these statutes that allow you to have or for your estate to posthumously have rights regarding your rights of publicity. And there are sometimes some strict requirements that you have to comply with. But once again, the publicity rights come back into play with regard to like recording artists or, you know, even if you're a fashion designer, you're a photographer, whatever, there's some value for you in your persona in general. And that's how it gets reflected. Um, regarding trade secrets, trade secrets are um, important because in many cases for business reasons, there are things that one business doesn't want another business to know. And a good example of that, that we can all relate to is recipes, right? So if someone has a recipe for, let's say Heinz ketchup has a recipe for Heinz ketchup. And while they have an obligation to disclose their ingredients on the bottle, what they don't have to tell us actually what their recipe is what percentage of the different ingredients they have in and how they cook it. And all of that can be secret, but the key to trade secrets in order for you to maintain a trade secret is that you must keep it secret. If you don't keep it secret, then you're not gonna be able to claim that it's a secret. So a lot of people see NDAs and 
other confidentiality language and agreements or a lot of times a lot of people come to me thinking that they need NDAs and they're confused they're thinking they need an NDA but what they really need is some type of non-compete like they want to show some uh, business plan or idea for a movie or a TV show or something to another person and they think they want an NDA and an NDA is some protection for that. But what they really want is the person to agree that they're not going to compete with them and try to take their idea and use it. And so um, trade secrets are, are equally important um, in terms of being intellectual property rights. They're particularly important to businesses that want to keep things like customer lists. Like let's say you work for sales in a certain corporation that customer list is typically considered a trade secret. And so the business goes through certain procedures in order to keep that information secret. They have employees sign agreements saying they agree not to disclose it. They agree not to use that information. They have to take certain precautions in the office when they have accessing the information, you know, have certain passwords and other things like that for the information to be protected because if you don't actively seek to protect the information, then there could be a court determination that that information is not entitled to trade secret protection. Um, so that's kind of our basics here on intellectual property rights. Thank you so much, Lita. I'm just gonna, before we kind of move on to the panel and I have some questions for all of you, I just wanna tell the audience that, you know, we, we have some really experienced individuals here on this panel. So this is your chance to get some, you know, solid expert information from them. So I really encourage you to drop any questions you might have in the chat and, and I'll make sure that I get it to them. Um, but yeah, so I have a question. I'll start off with Crystal. Um, so Crystal, I'm going to remove that spotlight. Okay, great. Uh, so Crystal, as a practicing artist, to what extent would you say you've had to interact with copyright and other forms of IP, you know, have IP law considerations become an active part of your creative process? Um, well, since I'm a songwriter, first and foremost, you know, lyric copyright, song copyright, I deal with that a lot. Um, I also, um, my music is sampled a lot. We also deal with licensing. Um, and I think from, I think, uh, from the, from, I also have a record label and I was mentioning earlier, I have to deal with copyright from other artists and producers. We have to deal with the new things like people sampling other people's voices off of other websites. Uh, Splice was the one I was referring to. So it gets a little complicated. A lot of people don't think they have to get it clear because they bought it off of a site. They got some vocals and that's not, you know, you have to, you have to get the rights from the person who actually wrote the song. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I'm still in it, you know, pretty deep, especially with the sampling and the licensing. And I've had some use of image um, licensing, you know, stuff to deal with. So it's, um, it's very important, you know, and I, I see a lot of people in the studio and they still don't, sit down and do the splits before they leave the studio and people coming in who just were just hanging around in the studio and said they claim they're part of the song and things like that. Um, so I still, you know, even, even putting your name in the title and things like that, I think is very important for artists just starting out. So, I, I mean, we, we were talking a little bit about this before the webinar started, you mentioned splicing. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that and what your experience has been with it? Well, Splice is a website, a platform where you can go in and purchase snippets of vocals. I think you can also do music, drum loops and things like that. And you have to pay a fee for it. So say the person was actually singing like four bars of lyrics and all right, you've paid for the song, you pay for the vocals, you put them in your songs, but you have to go and get the copyright clearance from the person who wrote that song. You have to include them in that and give them a percentage. And a lot of people don't, um, a lot of people just don't do that. And I think it comes back to bite them. I mean, it's almost just like people who samples, you know, say a famous song and they don't get the, I think Puffy said he's paying Sting like two million a year or something stupid. <laughs> So, you know, it's just like going to sample somebody like that and not getting permission. You can, it kind of comes and bites you back in the, in the butt a little bit. 
So splice is something that the people might feel DJs, they use a lot all the time. They take these vocals. They don't give the person their, you know, the credit. They don't put their names in the titles. And um, it's just, it's just something that I think um, is being overlooked and should be um, taken into consideration. Yeah. They might actually, that site might actually end up being sued uh, by the record labels because, and even some artists, they might claim that um, that is some type of copyright infringement for them to be actually creating those smaller snippets of a bigger song and offering it for sale. So we'll see what happens. It's it's a new, newish thing. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I'm surprised they're not sued already because yeah. there's a lot of a lot of stuff on there you can purchase. And they're not the only site. And there's people, there's artists, say you're an artist, you can go create, a, 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 say, an acapella, 16-bar acapella, and you can put it up there for sale. So you have to also know as an artist that you, you still get your copyright on that. Even if they buy it, you still get your publishing. So that's another aspect. Mm -hmm. Um. The okay, I have an, I have a question for Kim actually. Uh, so Kim, you are very well versed in in IP law, intellectual property law, and activism, and you work. You can't hear me. No, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I wanted to ask you, you because you work very closely with creatives. Uh, what would you say are some of the common obstacles? Uh, okay, sorry, Kim is having an issue with her sound. Give me a second. Mm. No, no, we can't hear you. And I guess you can't hear us. Okay. Um, we, I, I'm not sure what the issue is with, with, uh, with Kim's sound, but I think I will just move on to my question for Lita for now. Um, so, you know, you gave a really great little rundown on IP basics, but, but if a budding artist wanted to know, you know, some low cost, easy ways that that they can ensure that they are legally protected while pursuing creative work. Do you have any suggestions for that? Well, it, it only costs $45 to file your copyrights. So that's absolutely at a minimum when you're creating work. And then as Crystal said, after you, if you're, you know, whether you're creating a song, if you're writing a book with collaborators, if you're creating any type of a work with collaborators, as soon as you're done with the work, have a written agreement about what ownership percentages everyone is agreeing to and what their agreement is regarding their collaboration. That's probably the most important thing to do. And you could even write it on a piece of paper and everybody sign it, even if it isn't typed, it's still binding if it's signed, that's one of the biggest issues, whether it's disputes between co-authors of books or whether it's um, music or other types of art or creative works, writing movie scripts, making movies, you're making a movie, you have a bunch of friends, everybody sit down and do an agreement about what are you, each of your roles and what are each of you supposed to get out of it? How much are you going to contribute? Sit down and think about those business things because not having those business things done can actually be fatal to you in the long run if let's say you put a song up on the internet and it's a great song and it goes viral and you have three record labels that want to sign you but you didn't do the paperwork with the people that collaborated with you they're not going to do the deal with you until you get that done and now those other people have leverage over you in terms of what they want from you or what they want out of the work that they might not have asked for if you had just agreed at the time that the work was created, what the ownership percentages are and what everybody is supposed to get from the project. Other than that, it's actually filing your copyrights, right? Um, and um, it only costs $45. If your works have not been published, meaning that you haven't put them out in the public, then you can file all your works 
in a is a collection for one forty-five dollars. So let's say you've written twenty-five songs and none of them have been released. You can go and file a copyright registration for all 25 of them for $145. And you have to upload actually the written lyrics or the recording of it to the copyright office, but it's very doable and it's something you certainly could do. Um, regarding trademarks, I don't think it's advisable to try to do your trademarks on your own. Trademarks are a little tricky, um, but there are services that you can get sometimes pro bono services or flat fee services. Like we have a flat fee service of $1,500 to do a trademark. And it's every bit worth that expense um, to get that done. If you are doing something where your brand is very important, like you're a fashion designer, that's the most important legal thing you can do, right? You need to set up a company and do some other things. But in terms of protecting your brand, it's very important that you do that. Lisa, okay. can you talk about, I still have people ask me, can you mail the copyright to yourself? And is that binding? That's called a poor man's copyright. And <laughs> you can still a do poor it. man's copyright does not is not legal. Okay. All it does, it does do something. What it does is it establishes a certain date and time when your work existed. Now, the poor man's copyright is many of you may have heard of this that you um, mail whatever it is that you want to copyright to yourself right? But the most important thing is once you mail it to yourself, you can't open the package because if you open it, then you've destroyed the integrity of proving what was in the package on the date of the post stamp. So the reason why people said poor man's copyright was important is because the postage stamp from the post office puts a date and time of when that package was mailed. So that means that work was existing on that day. Now, that's not the same as filing your copyright with the copyright office. And it's not to be done if you, it's it's like I said, it's $45 to do your copyright. That's what you need to do because um, otherwise you're not going to get the benefit of a copyright. So when you file your copyright registration, you get a few benefits. One benefit is that if someone infringes your copyright and you have to sue them, you get your legal fees back. You can't even file a lawsuit claiming copyright unless and until you have your copyright registration back from the copyright office. So when you initially file your copyright, it takes the copyright office about six months. Sometimes they move faster. Maybe it's as few as four months. Sometimes it's longer, nine months to a year, but it takes that long for them to send you back your copyright registration, which is the same as a deed, like a deed to a house or a title to a car. It proves that you're the owner of the copyright. You can't even file a lawsuit until you get that back. So if someone infringes your copyright, you're going to have to wait until you get that or the copyright office will let you pay like $1,800, $1,500 to expedite your registration. And it can be done faster, but you're paying a huge premium for that. And you're losing out on getting your attorney's fees back and what we call statutory damages, which are damages that you can collect, which can be substantial for someone's intentional infringement of your copyrights. If you haven't filed your copyright before, for the infringement takes place, you can got, get attorney's fees or statutory damages. Good question, Krista. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So what I'm hearing is really register your copyright and think ahead before you kind of get into the creative process. I think what happens a lot of the time, and I think some of us on the panel are creatives ourselves. Of course, Crystal is, but you know, some side work that we might do is creative work and I find that it's very easy to kind of get lost in the creative process. So this is a good reminder to attendees to kind of just think ahead, um, you know, think about, about protecting yourself and how, you know, you want something like this to, to turn out in the end, how much you want out of it and how much you think right. your collaborators might want out of it. Um, okay. So Kim is back. I think her sound is working and this is for Kim, but you know, again, panelists, if if you feel like you have a good contribution, please jump in as well. But uh, so Kim, you are very well versed in IP law and activism, and you work very closely with creatives as well. So I wanted to ask you what you would say are some common obstacles faced by artists that 
they can you know, easily overcome with some knowledge of, of the IP regime. So I'm so sorry. I, I want to add on to something that Crystal touched on, and I probably sense that you guys might, might have taken a deeper dive while I was unable to hear the panel, which is regrettable. But I think that with the way that tech innovation has integrated itself into creativity in the music industry, um, the whole concept of collaboration um, has really become muddy. It's difficult. It's hard to navigate. Yeah. Um, and especially if, you know, if our artists don't fully understand the rights that they have and the power of their intellectual property and the power of the rights that are then inherent in, said, in, in that intellectual property and in the copyright protections. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the things that has just always moved me and has always been amazing to watch is when Lita is able to give her opening. And I hope everybody was listening because it's just a privilege to be able to learn um, from someone who's right there, really in the midst of it and on the cusp of how these things are evolving and changing along with the technology and the way that people are interacting, um, which would lead to the second thing that I see emerging now is how generative AI is going to be impacting all of these industries, right? So we've been seeing it already um, on social media, how, you know, we are, how folks are using AI to imitate and take the voices of others and then do covers of other songs. None of this stuff is getting cleared. None of this stuff is legal, um, you know, and there's going to be, I would suspect, you know, Crystal's um, similar to you or Lita's similar to your point about Splice. Yeah. I have a, a sense that the the industry is going to be coming for these uh capabilities oh, yeah. yeah definitely they are and I think the other piece that's really interesting and is always it's a joy but it's also a scary thing to watch is the way that creative people um creatively interact with this technology and so what I would not be surprised to see is watching how someone who is trying to create a song and to do some form of AI prompts, and we're already seeing it in the copyright office where we're seeing um, um, people trying to register uh, uh, drawings or designs that were actually created by an algorithm, and they're being rejected by the copyright office with some guidance, but it's still a little unclear. And I suspect that as we start interacting more and watching creatives interact more with this algorithm, with this new form of tech, we're going to see songs written or perhaps prompts and things that are going to be edited. Or we may see beats coming out. The whole thing is just this. Um, new area of murkiness and stickiness and um you know it's going to be our creatives that are going to be navigating that and you know I want to flag and it's always heavy on my mind is that you know it's going to be creatives of color those who are operating from the margins that this is going to have a disparate impact on right it's going to be us that slip through the cracks as folks try to figure out where these rights are all going to land um, so again, that's why it's so important to participate in and take advantage of opportunities like this, where you get to learn and hear from folks who have been, you know, doing the thing in the music industry for so long and really understand these things. Um, cause this is the foundation for which the new rules are going to be tied to and tethered to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think. IP law, maybe just law in general, seems very inaccessible because it's, you know, put on this pedestal very like people think it's very difficult to understand, but it is very important for artists and creators to know on kind of foundational level what their rights are so that they can tackle all of these issues and whatever's coming. I think one of if I'm if we're thinking of the same uh, copyright office uh, case. It was the comic book, was it? That was partially AI and partially actually drawn by the artist. And if I'm not wrong, I think the copyright office ruled that the, the portions of that were done by AI were not copyrightable. Um, I don't know if there have been any updates since then, but you know, I think that's also something that that could be good for artists to know that these are, you know, the trends and this is what what's happening right now as technology progresses faster than we can even kind of keep up. So it's it's interesting because when hip hop music first came out, rap music, the copyright office denied copy regist copyright registration as a song for 
hip hop music for rap music because they said it wasn't a song, it wasn't singing. They thought it was po more like a poem. And the reason why that's important is that music, unlike any other type of intellectual property right, photography, TV, film, nothing, nothing else is like it in that there's a whole ecosystem that is set up to collect royalties for music all over the world, not just in the United States, for collecting money, royalties for music. No other type of intellectual property enjoys that very important right of having this ecosystem that collects royalties. And so there's royalty collection societies everywhere that you're supposed to join in order to collect your money, right? And many of you have heard of ASCAP and BMI or Sound Exchange, and all these are royalty collection societies. And these types of entities exist in countries all over the world, and they're collecting royalties for music. There's no other type of intellectual property that has this type of an ecosystem out there that's operating for it. So it's really, really important and if you are in the music industry to understand your rights, because the Copyright Act only gives you three years. If someone leaves your name off of the copyright or doesn't give you a credit on the record, the law only gives you three years. And I'm not talking about infringements. I'm talking about creators. At the time you're creating, you're creating together. Let's say Kim Crystal and I create a song together and we put it out and don't put Kim's name on it. Kim only has three years to contest that. If she waits longer than three years, she loses her rights forever. And I get phone calls in my office literally every single day of an artist calling me saying, I sang on this record or I wrote this record or I did this or I did that. And it's some big record. And I say, well, did you file a copyright registration? No, they didn't. Is your credit on the album? No, it wasn't. Was your credit anywhere? Is did you register it with ASCAP? No, they didn't do any of that. So they're out of luck. They're never going to be able to capture their rights. So it's really important that you follow through with some of the things we talked about earlier, particularly in music, but for all types of intellectual property, it's important to have an agreement. And as Kim said, in this new era of techno digital technology where collaboration is very messy, you know, from the mashups to the splicing to now this AI stuff, it's or people buying tracks online. Um, that's an important thing to talk about because I see situations where people buy tracks online artists do, or they, um, or they rent them, which is even worse. Um, and then they put the music out and the music goes viral and a record company wants to sign them and they can't even get in touch with whoever it was that they got the music from in order to convey the rights. And if they can't do that, they're going to lose that deal or Nissan or someone contacts them and wants to use the song in a commercial. You have to be able to show chain of title and those little agreements that you get from people off the internet are not sufficient to establish chain of tribal for a major corporation to want to give you a big check for using your music. And I think Lita's point is a beautiful one because, you know, one of the things that I remain hopeful and I, and I do feel a shift. I do think that there's more of an appetite for these um, discussions amongst the creative community um, because you cannot be a responsible collaborator without understanding exactly what you're bringing to the table. Right. And so if you don't understand what you have the rights to use, then you cannot then offer that up as something to collaborate with another on. Um, and so that is another way of being a, a responsible uh, or participating responsibly in the creative process. Right. So, so I'll, I'll put this question out to you because so you write a melody and you write the lyrics. Are those two separate? Is that how, how would you split the percentage for that for people who say you wrote the melody and she wrote the lyrics or you wrote the lyrics and the melody? Okay, so so in so as a technical matter, um, if someone if one person writes the melody and another person writes the music, so we're not talking in in talking about this crystal. I think it's important for people to distinguish. We're not talking about a musical bed. We're not talking about a track. We're just talking about a melody that can be sung a, a cappella, right? Mm -hmm. So one person creates the melody, someone else creates the lyrics. You're, you're co-authors and you both have a right to claim some rights. Um, now, what has happened in hip hop, pop music, 
pretty much in even in dance music, the standard is that they don't give credit for people writing the melody. In general, it's just looked at as whoever, and this is an industry standard, whoever wrote the lyrics gets 50% and whoever did the music gets 50%. They really don't pay attention to whether or not the, the, the melody came from the musical track or whether it came from whoever wrote the lyrics. And so generally the split is considered 50-50. So if more than one person wrote the lyrics, they would split their interest. Let's say some one person wrote the bridge and the other person wrote the chorus and the verses. So maybe the split would be um, 35% and then the, the other person gets 15. And then some one person did all the musical tracks. So they get the other 50% because songs always have to add up to hundred percent. It can't be less than hundred percent and it can't be more than hundred percent or else no one will be able to collect their royalties. These royalty collection societies will not pay the money out. Okay. That I was just talking about. So it has to add up to a hundred. So, but in other genres of music, Crystal, like country music, gospel music, the person who does the melody gets a, gets that credit, gets that sectionalized, individualized credit for their contribution to the work. So it's just kind of how the, you know, how these different genres have developed over time in terms of what industry practices are. But just remember, everyone should remember, in the absence of a written agreement with the claim of co-authorship of most intellectual property rights, including specifically copyright, the courts will deem everyone to be equal owners. So if someone just contributed a few lines or a little bit to a musical track, but there's no written agreement and they go to court to try to work it out, the court just says everyone is equal. Let's say there were four writers, everyone gets 25%. Five writers, everyone gets 20%. Two writers, each person gets 50%. Even if one person only contributed some small thing and the other person did everything else, the mm -hmm. courts are not going to get involved in allocating, well, you contributed this and he contributed that. No, it doesn't work that way. It's just equal. And that's why song split agreements are important. Okay, I just want to give the audience an opportunity to say something. I, there, there's nothing in the chat at the moment, but if you did want to raise your hand to ask a question, feel free. Um, I will look out for it, but I will, in the meantime, move on to some of my last few questions. Um, I might be playing with fire a little uh, bit. There is one question, uh, Sri, Sri Lanka. Oh, can you see something I cannot? Yeah, it's Marquis says, I logged in a few minutes late, so I may have missed this. Are there any differences between the rights one has with registered and unregistered copyrights trademarks um, beyond the actual registration? Um, so I can, we did talk about that a little bit, but the answer is yes. The answer is that uh, for copyrights, if you don't register, you still have a copyright, but you can't sue. You can't enforce your rights until you file a copyright registration. So from the moment you fix your work in a tangible medium, your copyrights begin to exist. But until you actually register them with the copyright office, you can't sue. You can't, you can't actually enforce your rights. Uh, with regard to trademarks, it's a bit different. Trademarks, if you don't register a trademark, you develop what's called a common law trademark, and it could be limited to just where you are. So let's say you're just in Washington, D.C., you've only used it in Washington, D.C., then the rights that you have are limited to Washington, D.C. They're not throughout the country. Filing a federal trademark gives you rights all over the country, but as I indicated, it's limited to the country, federal rights. If you want a trademark in another country, you actually have to file and comply with the laws of other countries. Unlike copyright, once you register a copyright, because the U.S. is part of what's called the Bern International Copyright Convention, you essentially get copyright protection in most of the countries of the world. So those two things are very, the outcome is very different with trademarks and copyrights if you don't register. Um, but with remember with the trademark, you actually have to be using it. So if you go to try to get a trademark before you're using it, you can go get what's called an intent to use mark, which gives you some rights. But if someone else comes out and starts using the mark, then you have a problem. 
So it's best to actually get the mark, uh, get your trademark if you if you need a trademark and have it registered. Okay, Lita, I cannot see the attendees' questions. I don't know where, but if are there any more that you'd like to to um, respond to? That was the only one I see. Okay. Okay, I think that's everything from the audience. Um, I will just move very quickly into my last question. Um, and this one's for everyone, just jump in when you when you want, but what is a change that you would like to see in IP for, for creators, for artists? Do you think that the copyright or IP system is working for creators? Um, are there limitations? How can creators make the most of it? Anyone? Uh, oh, Crystal, you go first. Uh, <laughs> how to make it better? Um, I don't see anything other, other than things like this, getting informed, because it's, it's really complicated. If you, the more you the more you dig into it, it can get really good. I mean, I still call late to, I don't, I don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, um, I just think it's on everybody to, you know, to get informed and get educated about everything. It's just the only way to really make it better. Talk about it, you know? Yeah. And, and it's, it's important to be informed and there are some things that you can certainly do yourself. And then there's a certain point where you certainly need a lawyer's assistance, uh, whether you can find some pro bono legal service or you have to pay a lawyer, but remember to put a legal legal fees in your budget. If you're working on a project and you have a budget, allocate some money for legal fees because it's just as important as the money you're putting into creative. Um, I guess I would say there's some technical things like there's something called termination rights under the Copyright Act that after 35 years, you can um, put out a notice and try to recapture your copyrights, but it's only in the US. It's not your international rights that you get back. Um, I think that process needs to be streamlined. I think it should be more like 25 years instead of 35 years. And I think that it should be a lot easier for artists to exercise those rights, or they should actually just be automatic like after after 25 years of signing your copy right away, it automatically comes back to you. And I would say, I think kind of touching or building on Crystal's point, I, I think that we just need more clarity, right? It doesn't need to be as complicated as it is. And I mean, you know, I think about the concept of fair use, how, you know, we as a culture, we like, I think about hip hop, how we are the masters of remixing. And yet the, the rules in which governing that are really unclear. Um, and again, it has a disparate impact. When there is confusion, it has a disparate impact on those trying to create from the margins. Um, you know, I think about just Lita's point earlier about um, how the melody is protected or that you get credit for, for the melody in certain genres, but not in others, for example, hip hop. If anyone that listened to a track by Vicky or was someone who was a true fan of hip hop, they would instantly understand the melodic and brilliant choices that these artists are making and rethink the decision as to whether or not, or as to what is um, eligible for protection and what is not. So to me, there it, things don't have to be as uh, confusing as they are. Um, and I do feel like that clarity would really, really, really help those of us that are trying to create from the margins. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, does anyone have any last words before I wrap up? Any last pieces of advice? Although I think this panel is just chock full of advice. Thank you guys so much. You can get writer oh, splits say, PDF. Oh, I was just saying that you can always get PDF, writer split PDFs are free online. You can download, copy, share them. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, it really then, easy. There's even a couple of apps you can use to do it too that yeah. will have everybody confirm what their splits are when you put the when you put the song in. So it's just, that's very important. Um, I would just say, um, 
what's it's important to get a, a certain level of knowledge it's really important to read contracts if someone gives you a contract read it even if you don't understand it read it because the way you become knowledgeable is continuing to read them and after you read them over time it starts to make sense that doesn't mean you don't need a lawyer there's a difference between you as an artist or a business person what you bring to the table when you're reading a contract and what a lawyer is bringing to the table when they bring a contract. And there's certain important business things that you need to let the lawyer know. For instance, you meet with a record label. They say they're going to give you an advance of, you know, a hundred thousand dollars when you sign that when you sign the deal. They're going to put a certain amount of money into marketing. They're going to put five dollars per unit into marketing. They're going to do this, they're going to do that. They tell you all this stuff and then they give you a contract. And none of that stuff is in the contract. And you give the contract to your lawyer and ask your lawyer to review the contract, but you don't tell your lawyer that they told you they were giving you a $100,000 advance. You don't know it's not in the contract. You don't read the contract. And so that gets that never ends up in the contract because you never told your lawyer it was supposed to be there. So that's your role in the contract process is to make sure that the business terms, the things that you're supposed to be getting out of the deal are clearly written into the contract. And you can't assume that your lawyer knows whatever someone told you is supposed to be in the contract. You need to communicate that information to your lawyer or your agent or your manager so that they know what they're supposed to be looking for when they look at the contract. Thank you for that. I think that's really great advice. Just being the artist who, you know, you're sometimes the only person who can fill those gaps just because you give it to, to a lawyer to look at doesn't mean that you've covered all your bases. I think that's really great well, advice. There might be something very important to you creatively that needs to be written into the contract to make sure that that thing happens, mm -hmm. right? And you've got to tell the lawyer, I need this in the contract, right? Because what I see too often is after the fact, a client is coming to me saying, this contract was supposed to say this, this, and this. And I say, well, did you tell your lawyer that? Because it's not in here. I don't see anywhere in the contract where it says they were supposed to give you $100,000. Well, that's what they told me. Well, guess what? It's not going to be enforceable. I will say just very quickly on that, Lita is right. It The first time you read a contract, it's going to be daunting. It's not going to be light reading at all but the more that you read it the that's easier right. it gets to digest so that's also another piece of uh, great advice um i think yeah well thank you everyone i think this was has been such an amazing discussion um before we all go i just i just wanted to let everyone know about iipsj's next webinar um in may 23rd may it's ip for entrepreneurs um, it might be relevant to you uh, as a creator. You might be, you know, doing work that involves kind of entrepreneurship. So this is another great session for you. Um, we covering topics like IP must-haves for your business and how to turn your IP into into a product. Registration, as always, is completely free, and you can find more information on the website uh, on the IIPSJ website, which is linked for you. Th so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.